Hello, I'm Gary Stahl. And I'm Tommy. And you are now watching the Unicycle Factory documentary. This video was supposed to be about the making of my seven and a half foot tall giraffe from the unicycle factory. We will go over that later, but first I'd like to tell you about my friend Tom Miller, who is the unicycle factory. He's such an interesting character with his fabrication skills and writing skills that I decided to turn this into an amateur documentary. You're about to learn about Tommy, his company, then the making of my seven and a half footer. Here we go. The Unicycle Factory is located in Kokomo, Indiana. Although the name implies a large operation with an assembly line, it's really just Tom and his garage making custom creations one at a time. It's easy to find Tommy's house. It's the only one with a bowling ball pyramid in the front yard. Tommy officially started business in May of 1984 and has been doing it ever since. He makes all kinds of rideable things, but his core business is making custom unicycles. He has made them very small and very tall. The smallest unicycle he made for Chaz Marquette had a wheel diameter of only 14 millimeters. The wheel assembly for that gives you an idea of his metalworking skills. Here it is with and without its tiny bearings. He bought the bearings and chain, but made the wheel and sprocket out of a solid piece of stainless steel. On the other end of the spectrum, Tommy's made unicycles with wheels up to 56 inches in diameter. Unicycles aren't the only products, though. For example, Tommy can make off-center wheels. Here's the bicycle guy, Bob Swaim, riding his bicycle with off-center wheels from the unicycle factory. Now back to the unicycles. Not only does Tommy make them in every size possible, he makes them in about every flavor imaginable. Here's one of my favorites, a co-creation with Sim Abrahams. That's Sim riding it. This unicycle can become taller or shorter while riding it. Most customers keep their unicycle factory acquisitions for a long time, like John Foss here with his 45-incher. Dave Bagley will probably never sell his toys, especially since they were his ideas. This pic shows his crab cycle, which goes sideways. A simple change can be made with the gearing for it to travel east or west. Dave wanted this geared unicycle to pedal backwards like a two-wheeler. Dave also deserves recognition for hosting the Unicycle Factory website, sillycycle.com, for Tommy and the unicycle community. He has always done that for free. Thank you, Dave. Many of you will not have any idea what kind of riding skills Tommy has. I'll let these old videos speak for themselves. Double O unicycle. Actually, I enjoyed this one the most over the years because I was forced into having to relearn how to ride a unicycle and I hadn't done that for years. Actually, it actually took me another four or five hours of practice to get used to this one and it actually took me about three and four months to finally find the time to do it so I guess it was really long and drawn out. The double wheel unicycle. Well you guys want to know how do we get up on these things. This is how you get up on a five and a half foot tall one. I get three chances, but today I only need the one. <laughs> Here we go, walking the wheel on a triple wheel unicycle. I like this. What do you think? One, two, 
three, three clubs in one. Back up a little bit, ready? A little bit of running room. There we go. Juggling three clubs on a 12 foot unicycle. Yeah. <laughs> Backwards. The cycle is 16 foot high, weighs about 48 pounds, takes about a week and a half to build, two loops of chain to cut down on all the whips back and forth, and I have ridden taller, 22 feet and 24 feet. There we go, rocking. I'm actually having to lean into the wind. Uh oh, wind's blowing me. As Tommy said, He's ridden a 22-footer and a 24-footer. We don't have any video, but here are four pics of Tommy with his 22-footer. Here he is again, this time on the 22-footer he made for Chaz Marquette. Moving on up, we have the only known pics of Tommy riding his 24-footer. Only one person has ridden a taller unicycle without safety equipment, and that was Dennis Frizzoli on a 35-footer. Lastly, we have Tommy juggling and passing clubs with Greg McElwain. All right, Tommy, thanks for joining us. I wanted to do this interview on a tall unicycle, so that's where you're in your natural habitat. <laughs> so let's start off and tell them about the history of your company, which is, of course, the Unicycle Factory. You're a one-man show, but before the Unicycle Factory, it was... Well, Tom Miller unicycles, and I didn't like the way TMU was stamped on the frame, so I was looking for a different initials, and there was a place next door called the Potato Factory, and I liked the, the, the novelty of that sound, and so I, I needed something that told what I did all in one name. It was also Custom Cycles by Tom, and everybody kept thinking bicycles. So the Unicycle Factory covered everything all in one conversation, so then it became TUF, tough, on the frames. So we did interviews on our tall unicycles for like a whole afternoon and wind noise wreaked havoc and trashed our, most of our videos. So here we are in my shop. Make the best of it. Okay, back to your company. So in high school, you took drafting classes and you taught yourself how to weld. Right. So after high school, you joined the Air Force, and they put you through a 16-week course on welding, right? Right. And that went, that covered what? Well, the gas welding, the arc welding, and the TIG welding yeah. for aluminum and, and stainless steel, and some titanium. Okay. And then from there, then they send you off to your job, and then you polish off what you need here and there. Uh, I got stuck in civil engineering where we repaired things on the base, which I dearly love more than trying to repair airplanes. Um, uh, so that, that helped, you know, polish off a lot of my activities. Yeah. Now with the unicycles and stuff like that, you primarily use what? What you mean, welding? What type of welding? Oh, right now just strictly the uh, the stick uh, stick arc welding. Yeah. Even though I've got the MIG welder and the TIG welder, there's just not enough you know stuff coming and going for me to actually plug them in because of the cost of the gases to keep them going. Yeah. Arc welding's a lot cheaper. Okay. Uh, and it's adequate because we're not really dealing with uh, you know chromoly steel too much or, or stainless steels. And so uh, I just let those machines sit. Yeah. But you know how to use them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Later in the documentary, we'll show your milling machine in use. So why don't you tell everybody how you came to get it and how you learned how to use it? 
Ooh, many years ago when I was down in Florida visiting my parents, uh, there was the, the juggling club down there. Some guy saw what I was doing with unicycles and he was an ex-machinist for Honeywell, uh, John Muller from Florida. And I guess he latched on to me, wanting to impart some of his skills and abilities. And so he used to come to Kokomo and visit and try to you know, pass as much as he could along with my lathe and so forth. But he saw this huge void that I needed a milling machine, even though I'd vaguely bought one and hadn't put it in use. But it was a production milling machine. Because um, as far as I was concerned, I just machined small little parts here and there. But he said, you need this milling machine and you need it this big. And I thought this thing was huge at 2,000 pounds. But he's the one to help finance it for two and a half thousand dollars. But he neglected to tell me about the four thousand dollars of tooling that was going to go into it. But he was eventually dead on right, and the more equipment I've got to it, the more uh, opens my mind to making other parts and pieces. I get a kick out of the fact that you've made adapters for it using the machine itself. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> reverse cannibalism? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, hold on a second. <laughs> And so for Gary, these aren't unicycles, but they attach to his ladder to hold his ladder oh, down on his trailer. Wow. Surprise! Yeah. You know, oh. and the milling machine allows me to carve these to clamp around his ladder, in, in essence, and, and so forth. So it just allows, if I didn't have the milling machine, I couldn't have, uh, you know, really processed those things out. Um, but, you know, unicycles are not the only thing I build. I build a lot of other little things here and there, too. But unicycles are the primary focus. Remember, I've done like 900 of them so far. Yeah. So... Uh, I don't have video of it. I'll show you my ladder that he's talking about, and this will be an improvement over the video that you're going to see. So thank you. And the whole idea is to make it more stable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold, hold the ladder down because it's wobbly up there. I guess the job done, but it's a work in progress. So we need better turnbuckles. Yeah. Thank you. So Tommy, in your early days, you did a ton of big wheels. And I want to make a point to you people watching that I know you're all familiar with 36 inches. They're available from multiple vendors, but that wasn't always the case. And back in your early days, like I said, you did a ton of big wheels. Yeah. And uh, tell us how you got started with that. <sighs> the original unicycling newsletters from back in the 70s spoke about Wally Watts riding around across Canada and eventually around the world on his unicycle. And they conveyed, or Bill Janak would actually convey some of the construction techniques, taking an old bicycle rim and stretching it out and making a much larger rim out of it, uh, rewelding motorcycle spokes and threading them you know, to make them extra long and modifying a, a unicycle axle or whatever he did at the time and where they got the rubber and Bill Janak told us where we can get multiple locations of the rubber. And I figured if he can do it, then I'm going to take a stab at it also. And I bent my rims out. And uh, luckily, because we moved to Indiana, we were only 90 miles away from one of the rubber suppliers. And with me and father, we made a father and son trip up to uh, Huntington, Indiana to have the tire put on. Um, and so little things. Well, somebody else found me the size thread location for the, the bicycle to spokes. And I spent two weeks delivering newspapers to earn enough money to buy the threader to thread the spokes. And so it was just a nice little long quest here and there. And after I built it, I think the first one was 48 inches, and it, you know I got featured in one of the unicycling newsletters for what I did because I took information and got reprinted again as far as what I did. And uh, one time I even did an air pneumatic tire, and Bill Janak says, as far as he's concerned, this is the first large pneumatic tire out there by sewing two tires together. <laughs> you guys missed out on a lot of fun. So uh, Paul Fox was one of the first ones to ask me to build one, and his daughter used it to ride 100 miles for the female world record of 10 hours and 37 minutes. Floyd Beatty ordered a 40 inch and then later a 45 inch for his world record efforts to ride uh, 100 miles in like seven hours and 15 minutes. Um, and so I did about 100 of those large big wheeled unicycles, but once the uh, Coker 36 inch tires came out, that was the end of it, except for Marty Atchell, who's in his late 60s and still active and riding him as ultimate wheels. This last one was a 48 inch ultimate wheel. The biggest one I've done for Mr. Chaz Marquette, 56 inch wheels. Now what possessed you to ride taller and taller unicycles? Well, uh, some of us, we always strive for better and better. And of course, you know, then you start seeing other people uh, riding taller ones. Yeah, that backs again with the unicycling newsletter. It showed Clyde Crandall and Floyd Crandall riding a 16-footer and a 20-footer 
Well, if they can do it, then I want to do the same thing too. So you just start doing more because you're going to get more and more attention. Right. And so, you know, and eventually you'll be on a 10-footer, we understand. <laughs> I own one, and you made it. <laughs> so yeah. we just got to work your way up there and realize that they're all the same. And don't forget Connie Cotter, female world record at 16-foot that I built. Yeah. So, you know, once she realized she could do a 12-footer, then the 16-footer came out next after that. So don't forget about Connie. She's, she's got the world record for females. Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the first giraffe you ever rode, you had made. Yes. And it was how tall? Eight and a half foot tall. It's the piece of pipe that I found at the scrapyard determined its height. So you went from riding a regular unicycle to an eight and a half foot unicycle. Yeah. That's nuts. I'm nuts and I can prove it. So I've asked Tommy to close his eyes. I've got a laptop here with a picture he's not seen uh, in this particular fashion. Okay, go ahead and open your eyes, Tommy. Yay! <laughs> on the left is you, and on the right is Chaz Marquette. Those are 22 footers. That's actually and the same unicycle. The same unicycle. So tell us a story about uh, what we're seeing here. Me and Chaz originally met through the telephone back around 1983 when he ordered an eight inch air inflated wheeled unicycle. Um, then later on he requested a 22 foot tall unicycle. I had a 24 footer that weighed 90 pounds and it was difficult to ride. I only rode it three times. So I, after doing the first 24 footer, it was too strong. And so I figured out it's gotta be lighter weight to be more controllable. So he made a request. So the first thing I did was I built me a 22 footer to verify the new and improved design that I made his. We met in Syracuse, New York, and Syracuse University. Um, the photograph that you might be seeing is actually from John Foss when he happened to be there taking it. That's the uh, one on the left. The one on the left. Yeah. Um, and so I, at this point, so Chaz is getting a 22-footer, and one of the good things about it is that by me riding it first, test riding it, it proves to him that it mechanically works. It is a very scary thing when you build a super tall unicycle and you're scared, will the chain bind up someplace? So that helps take away a lot of the fear right there, just knowing it mechanically works. And uh, like I said, John Foss happened to be there at the time and because it was painted white, it showed up very well in the photographs and it's been used quite a bit over, over time. So, but it's, you know, something that people don't forget when they see the super tall one. I one time actually wrote it between pedestals at Ringling Brothers Circus in between shows. And it was fun to watch the circus performers watch me, the <laughs> amateur. And I realized even entertainers need to be entertained. Yeah, sure. And so I was one of my glorious parts, you know, to ride that in Market Square Arena, which is the last place Elvis Presley performed. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> the unicycles, the tall ones, aren't difficult, but they scare you to death, and then you lose your sense of balance because you're so scared. So if you can conquer that level of fear, a lot of us can ride the tall ones. Yeah. Um, and I just trust the equipment and I've grown, you know, 8 foot, 10 foot, 12 foot, 16 foot over time. And I've learned to keep my wits about me. You trust it because you've made it. Okay, Tommy, I want to ask you about your 24 footer that you have ridden. How old were you when you made it? Oh, 22 years of age. 22. What possessed you to make one that tall? Why did you pick 24 feet? The tubing was 20 feet in length, and then I added enough for the wheel and the excuse me the wheel and the seat, and it ended up being 24 foot. Okay. It wasn't a target; it just started off with 24 foot long or 20 foot long material. Gotcha. So <laughs> I remember you said that after you made it and rode it, you realized that there was a flaw with it, and that was that it, it weighed 90 pounds, and it took both arms spinning to get the unicycle to turn back and forth. So it was difficult to steer that extra weight and the footprint that it had on the ground. So that first ride must have been a zinger. Yeah. <laughs> now keep in mind, I used to ride the 18 footer before that. So it was only a six more foot uh, taller. Just six more feet. But you didn't think the weight was critical, but in that particular case, it did prove to be there. Yeah. Do you remember the thought going through your head when you first took off and then you realized it was gonna be Oh, pretty hard to turn to get well, back where you came from. Well, first of all, you anticipate making big turns, not right. drastic, small, tight ones. <laughs> right. Big open area. Yeah. So you so, had that, I guess. 
but I was the fool that I went all the way over to Marion, Ohio, with it on top of my van, and decided to ride it over there, 150 miles away from home or a hospital. <laughs> Worry too much. <laughs> Tommy, I'm going to show your business card to everybody for two reasons. One is uh, so that they can get a hold of you, which would be by phone. <laughs> <laughs> that is the only way. Internet virgin. Sorry, guys. Yeah. And the second is because I want everybody to see your mascot, <gasps> Guilford. Go for it. 34 so. years of Guilford has been in my life, yes. Yeah. Now, the business card, of course, is black and white, which is how it started. So tell us all about the, the evolution. I was always intrigued with the, the Big Daddy Ed Roth style, and there was also a Playboy cartoon cut out with his tongue hanging out. And I was trying to represent something that expressed the wildness of the unicyclers. And I was talking to John Foss about what my goal was, the stick shift in one hand and a steering wheel in the other hand, and the tongue out and pedaling down on the unicycle. And ironically, his friend, Mike Cazalet from high school, used to draw this style, and so I guess he conveyed to Mike, and all of a sudden it shows up one day, and it is glorious, and just all the little details with this, the tongue and the saliva coming out of it, and all the muscle tone here and there, and I just always look at all the little details, except for right here, he left part of the fork off over in there. <laughs> in essence, but it's still great. It probably would have added clutter to the spring, but it's just, it's been with us for the last 33 years. Oh yeah, it became a staple. Now this particular version uh, came from John Moeller, right? The same yeah. guy that uh, helped with the milling machine. Yeah, John used to fly in from Florida and spend as much as a month at my house, back when people used to come and visit for several days. And you know, um, and I guess he went home and, and just enlarged it on the copy machine and then cut it, put it on half inch plywood and cut it out and colorized it and sent it to me. So just, you know, there's been a lot of people contribute here and there. Dan Bedford, Darren Bedford had buttons made up with them all over the place. Um, it's, it's been airbrushed. It's been, t you know, utilized by other unicycle clubs at one time because they really like the style of the logo. They'd always seem to ask for permission and I always get a free t-shirt out of the deal. So that was kind of <laughs> nice. I just, it expressed kind of how we felt. Yeah. And then this guy? Uh, this was done at the Sheridan, Iowa unicycle meet. They had a local wood carvers club up there selling little miniature unicycles, uh, cavemen or whatever at the time, you know, for like $20 a piece. And I was intrigued, well, hey, you guys do carving and everything else. Uh, can I ask you to build me a three-dimensional one out of it, you know, carve it for me? And I offered the guy, you know, $150 because they were already doing the other stuff for like 20 and just asked for it to be a little bit bigger. And several months later, it shows up much bigger than I anticipated and found out the guy spent 100 hours at it. So I, even though I offered him 150, I gave him 300 dollars, trying to be vaguely fair about the whole thing. It's painfully, very rarely does anybody ever see the guy. Lots of people are going to see him now. Yes, it was money well spent, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Last but not least, we give credit to the artist here, Harold Clark, is the guy that carved this. Thank you, Harold. Nice job, Harold. <laughs> So I need to explain to everybody why, this, why we're doing this documentary in the first place. So in 2016, I called you up and I ordered a seven and a half foot giraffe. And you said, what I'd rather do is show you how to make the giraffe just for the price for the parts. And then you make a video to put on YouTube that would show to everybody how much work and expertise and all that goes into it. That way when they call you up and ask for a price on whatever it is, they'll have a better understanding of why it costs what it does. You get a chance to see the machinery and tooling that have been adapted just strictly for building unicycles that, you know, you have no idea what goes into it sometimes. Right. So, uh, the deal is done. You've already seen the unicycle. It's what I wrote in the intro. And I love it and I will be keeping it till I die. <laughs> <laughs> and then it'll live beyond that. Too. Oh yeah, yeah. And now it's time for the main part of the documentary. The making of my seven and a half foot giraffe. Before going into the actual build, I'm going to tell you about Tommy's different frame designs. For giraffes up to nine feet tall, Tommy uses what he calls his A frame. Here's my seven and a half footer as an example. The A frame is basically a square tubing version of the Schwinn giraffe, which they made from 1977 
1983. Schwinn used round tubing, whereas Tommy uses square tubing for easier welding. Another key difference is that mine has steps. The Schwinn giraffe was 5.5 to 6 feet tall, depending on the seat adjustment. I threw this pick in to show you the difference in height between the two. Now the A-frame is very strong, but it's only suitable for giraffes up to 9 feet. Over that height, it can flex slightly, which is a concern for the chain. If you toss your chain riding a giraffe, you're going down. Needless to say, that would be bad news on one of the taller ones. To deal with this, Tommy developed his diamond frame. This example is my 10-footer frame before I picked it up from the powder coater. It's heavier, of course, but this design can be used for giraffes up to 12 feet tall with no chain worries. On a personal note, I think it's a really cool looking design. For anything over 12 feet tall, Tommy uses a frame design he calls the antenna tower. This is a 16 foot example he made for one of his customers, Mark Lippard. As I said before, Tommy also makes tiny giraffes. Each one of these is a unique one-off design. Now it's time for the making of my giraffe. Tommy's made lots of seven and eight footers, but I was the first to request a seven and a half footer. For that, he had to modify his seven footer design. Rather than just make it six inches taller, he made sure we would arrive at that height with the seat adjusted for my legs, which are short. The change was made in the length of the fork blades. For my custom uni, they would need to be a little over 54 inches long. 54 and 3 eighths to be exact. Those fork blades ended up being the first thing we worked on. Tommy pulled out a long piece of one inch square tubing and we cut two pieces to length. As you can see, my giraffe will have some long legs. Here's an old sample that shows our next two steps. If you look at the left side of the sample, you will see what each fork blade will look like after we flatten them. The right side shows what they will look like after having a slot milled into them. Torches will be used to get the metal red hot so that we can smash it with the crusher. What is the crusher? You're about to find out. So, Tommy, is there a preferred end to stick in here to smash? Oh, yeah. What you want to do is find the actual weld seam because it has more imperfections and you want to hide it inside the frame. Uh -huh. And that way it won't show up through the paint as bad because of it. So that part down? Yes. The weld seam down. Crusher. Tommy made the crusher, by the way. You'll see many more tools he has made as we go on. Here you see me using Tommy's milling machine to create the slot where the wheel will go. I'd like to point out that I am not a metal fabricator or machinist. Anything I know about these things I learned from Tommy during this project. The general agreement we had was for me to do as much of the work as possible. Tommy would demonstrate a skill than have me do it. There were some exceptions, like welding. Tommy did all of that. I learned that most of the knowledge and expertise with the milling machine lies in the setup for a specific task. Once it is set up, the actual milling is not difficult. I kind of look like I know what I'm doing here, but Tommy did all the setup. the handle one full turn up. This one, one full turn. 
Come on, yeah, keep going. Yeah, yeah. Now, now feed it. I look up. Before and after. Oh. oh. <laughs> Put them side by side. Oh, I got you. Like this? This is the end of the fork blade. It's not perfectly square at this point in time. The goal is to square off the very bottom edge, round off the corners, and get a flat surface for appearance. Also, the flat surface is for a better area for the washers to grip. Go, Gary! At this point, after smashing the frame and grinding the fork blade ends, Gary's about to deburr or take off any little sharp edges with the uh, grinding wheel and with the wire wheel, take off any of the uh, oxidization or scale that's on the back side of it because we won't be able to access it during the painting process. So he's mostly just doing the inside of the frame. How about it? This is a three horsepower coffee machine. It is so powerful. If you get your arm locked in it, it won't even say I'm sorry or excuse me, it just keeps spinning as your arm dangles all over the room. The surface of that wheel is running about 60 miles an hour. Got a rough spot. That grinding wheel is actually made out of cloth. You can see the layers if you look close. The surface has been coated with an abrasive material that eventually wears down. When it does, Tommy has to use an oven to bake on more of that material. Ta da! Okay. I don't know, it's not going to show up much, but. Well, before we had rough spots, now we don't. I want to elaborate on what Tommy said earlier. The frame will soon look like this. Once it is welded like this, you cannot access the inner sides with the wire wheel, especially up where the fork blades meet. That's why he had me clean those sides beforehand. The other sides can still be cleaned up with the wire wheel after the welding is done. This picture shows the fork blades with a temporary spacer where the wheel will go. Above that, you see my three attempts at making the cross brace. That's how many it took for me to get one to fit right. 
The angles on the side made it challenging. Once I got it right though, we were ready for some welding. Now I was pretty excited at this time because my frame was starting to take shape. In case you're wondering, I shot the welding scenes with my eyes closed so that I wouldn't damage my eyes. Okay, when building the A-frame, you put in a dedicated spacer. But one of the secrets about the spacer is about an eighth of an inch wider than the finished product. Because when you weld it here, steel tubing wants to work because of welding and it's actually pulled in. So now we'll no longer need the spacer. And when you move it, you'll find out that actually has crept in about an eighth of an inch wider, hopefully match the unicycle axle when you're all done. Then more time was spent using the angle grinder, grinding wheel, and wire wheel, so the welds would go from looking like this to looking like this. Sweet! Next, we cut a piece of one and a quarter inch square tubing for the top part of the frame. You can now get a feel for the size of the giraffe. That piece of square tubing will go along with this piece of round tubing to make what Tommy calls the seat mast. This picture shows the progression from separate parts to completed seat mast. There are three challenges we will deal with. One is the fact that the inside diameter of the round tube is too tight for the seat post to slide in. Second, the round tube needs to be welded inside the square tube, but it fits loosely. Lastly, the round tube must be centered and straight when it is done. All these challenges will be overcome. At this point, Gary is trying to center in the seat mast top tube, and he's trying to center it in a four jaw lathe chuck. I'm doing this just to irritate him. I could have given him a three jaw chuck, but <laughs> I thought he could enjoy this. So he has to move it back and forth a few thousands at a time until it gets dead centered. Now, loosen a little bit. And it's tight down on the other side. And trying to get it within about a thousandth of an inch centered. Check, check, recheck. This is the second one. The first one he did uh, exceptionally nice. It did take almost three days, but he got there. <laughs> Honestly, it took me over an hour, and I was brain dead afterwards. Not only does the tube need centered, it also has to be perpendicular to the flat part of the chuck. So you are working on two separate goals at the same time. Machinists know what I'm talking about. It is not something you become good at quickly. I'm not drilling out much, just a twenty thousandths. If we were a big industry, we'd be able to order the tubing dead on. But we just need three and a half inches. So I have stuff that's close, and then I cut it as needed. That was it for day two. My brain was mush, but I left very happy. Okay, so this these two pieces are going to become our seat mast on the top of the giraffe frame. And this has to be welded in here, but as you can see, there's some slop. The inside has been machined to where it needs to be. So, the trick is going to be, I'm going to sacrifice some tape about that far in. Tommy says about four times around, once, twice, three times, four times. Roughly should give us a snug fit. If not, knock it off three. Oh, I think that's about right.
We want it sticking out and two inches. Two inches. We'll measure that up. So now that we've got that in there with the tape, uh, it still has a, the possibility of being off at an angle when it gets welded, and we don't want that. So Tommy has a, lack of a better word, a jig piece. This part's going to go inside of this and make sure that it's true. And we got a piece of tape in here so that it will be snug sitting inside there. How far you want that in, Tommy? Well, as far as it'll go till it bottoms out. Till it bottoms out. Or something like it. Ready for welding. At one point in the project, Tommy asked me if I wanted to try welding. I declined because we had already done so much work on a giraffe and I didn't want to screw it up. I also didn't want to take any more of Tommy's time. He was being very generous with his time the way it was. <laughs> so here I've only just tack welded it with the uh, 6011 rod to make sure it's all centered and located. Now I'm going to hit it with a 7014 rod which is more mellow and doesn't have as much penetration but it'll give a smoother weld when you're done. After filling in the weld, there was more grinding and work with the wire wheel until the seat mast looked like this. Okay, after he's made the piece on the top and we weld it into the seat mast, the welding and all the heat cause the insides of it to sometimes shrink, causing the seat post not to want to flow through easily through the assembly. So what I have here is an adjustable blade expansion reamer. It will go through and re-clean out and scrape all the imperfections out of there. Oh, it is. This one happens to be adjusted from past previous usage. Plenty of oil. Oil is cheap. Reamers are expensive. And you start rotating and letting it slowly advance a little at a time. If you take too much, it'll stop and you have to back out and tie it again. So this is actually just scraping the inside. So now I'm going to let Gary take over. You feel it? I do, and it's self-feeding. Like we discussed, all we're doing is taking it back to what we had from the lathe. This one's not too bad. There have been some ones I've had to really, really fight. So not a complete demonstration because this one didn't shrink as much as we've seen in the past. So tell him what we're doing next, Tommy. Well, at the very top, he's got a little bit of a burr on the very edge. So he's going to use a deburring tool and just round it out. Just sit there and hand crank it. Okay, I'm starting <laughs> to get the feel for it where you're hitting the edge mm -hmm. curve part of it. Might need a little bit more force in there. Cause that tool to bite in there. Now I'm feeling it. You've gone too far when you break it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it feels clean. With the seat mast done, it was now time to start working on this simple looking round tube. Believe it or not, several hours were spent getting it right due to its important function. Why? Let me put it this way. If you're riding a bicycle and the chain comes off, you're probably not going to end up breaking any bones. Okay. So we've actually taken a long length of two and three eighths tubing with a uh, almost a quarter inch wall thickness and actually cut off a two and three quarter inch piece of material because the saw is not going to cut perfectly. We will now put it on the lathe and true up both sides so they're parallel. So we've actually added extra meat so that when we're cutting the finished product will be two and five eighths. <laughs> Hi Gary, what we up to? <laughs> Well, I want to talk about some terminology. So on a bicycle, we call this the bottom bracket. Yeah. And here we've got the piece we're going to use for that on my unicycle. But it just doesn't make sense on a tall unicycle like this to call it the bottom <laughs> bracket. <laughs> when it's all the way up there. I know. Well, many years ago when I started building bicycles, they called that a bottom bracket. But being as I'm building unicycles, I call it a crankcase housing. They're single piece crank housings or bottom brackets and three piece bottom brackets. I prefer to use the single piece because it's a lot easier to machine. Fair enough. With our starting piece cut for the crank housing, it was once again time for me to work with my nemesis, the lathe. Tommy had me do the setup again 
and I bet it took me an hour to get the tube perfectly perpendicular to the chuck. You can't just butt it up to the chuck. You have to leave a small gap because a bandsaw does not provide a perfect 90 degree cut. You can see that gap in this picture. So once I had the tube adjusted in the chuck, we cut the right end so that it was a perfect 90 degrees. That took several passes with the cutter, taking just a few thousandths of an inch off each pass. Here's the last cut for the first side. Tommy put some brown marker on here and it is gone all the way around. I believe it's true. Yes. Once that side was true, I took it out and painstakingly mounted it in the chuck the other direction. This time I was able to butt the tube right up to the chuck since that end was true, but I still had to make sure it ended up perfectly perpendicular to the chuck. Then we cut the other end of the tube until it was true and at our goal length of 2 and 5 eighths inches. By doing this, we guaranteed that both ends were 90 degrees and parallel. Otherwise, the crank assembly would not work well. Oh, sorry. This pic shows another jig Tommy made long ago. It's used to hold the seat mast and crank housing together properly for welding. As with most welding tasks, it's a two-step process. The first step is tack welding, of course. Unfortunately, warping will occur even with the jig. Here's Tommy measuring to see how much the seat mast went off course as a result of the initial tack welding. To deal with this, Tommy uses what he calls strategic welding. See the difference? Yeah. After determining which direction the seat mast went off course, Tommy marks which side he will resume welding. That will pull the seat mast back towards center. Once that welding was completed, we polished the part and set it in the milling machine. Here we are creating a slot where the seat clamp will go. After it is done, we will make another slot on the opposite side. Two slots are necessary for the seat clamp to function right due to the thick material of the round tube. <laughs> While editing this video, I realized Tommy filed the top of the fork blades to better mate with the crank housing, but he hadn't done that to the bottom of the seat mast. I asked about that, and he said it's because the square tubing of the seat mast is much thicker than the square tubing of the fork blades. Because of the thicker seat mast material, Tommy could overcome the gap without burning through the metal. With the thinner fork blades, he needed a better fit. Otherwise, he could have easily burned through the thinner material during the welding. The seat mast tubing is thicker than needed because it provides a closer fit for the round tube. Remember when we put tape on the round tube to help center it for welding? There are numerous little details in Tommy's plans that all have a reason. Any one detail could be changed, 
but it would result in changes needing to be made elsewhere. And now it's time for a very exciting part of the project, the joining of the top and bottom frame pieces. Tommy has more jig work ready to hold the pieces in proper alignment. He made the special clamps at the top and the bottom. So we're getting ready to weld it. And because I'm welding thick material to thin material, it's too easy to burn through. So I've got this little secret weapon of just a filler material that I lay in there. You need filler anyway. My seven and a half footer is coming together and I am psyched. Starting to get real, Tommy. Real tall, that is. A little unwieldy. <laughs> After welding the top piece to the bottom piece, the crank housing is milled out to the proper dimension to receive the bearing cups. The actual piece that does the cutting is called a ground to size shell reamer. It has one purpose in life, to mill crank housings to specs so that cups fit properly. This process had to be done after the welding due to, you guessed it, the inevitable warping. After milling both sides, the frame was in a state where it could be ridden. It wasn't done, of course, but it was cool knowing the frame could actually be used at this point. That wrapped up day four, and what a day it was. For day five, our goal was to make the steps for my giraffe. Since I requested an odd height of seven and a half feet, Tommy gave me the option of having one or two steps. Because of my short legs, I opted for two. After figuring out where the steps would go, Tommy had me cut two pieces of eighth inch thick steel. This pick gives an overview of the bending process. The first piece on the left shows scribe marks where the bends will be made. The piece in the middle shows what it looks like after the first bend. That bend curls the step upwards from my feet to have some traction on the step. The piece on the right is upside down, but it shows the 90 degree bend where the step will be welded to the frame. Here I am using an adjustable T-square to get the scribe marks where they needed to be. This contraption is another of Tommy's creations. It is called a brake. He didn't invent the brake, but he did make this one himself. I'm about to use it to perform the last bend. Tommy had me practice on scrap first before bending the actual steps. Bending steel is not hard, but achieving the desired angle takes some work. If you want a 90 degree angle, you must bend it more than 90 degrees due to spring back. The amount of spring back varies somewhat with each piece. You determine how far the bend needs to go, then adjust something called a stop so the brake will not bend past that point. The steps aren't done yet because I need to round the corners and modify them for chain clearance. That required some of this and a whole lot of this to end up like this. The contours aren't perfect, but at least I can say I made the steps myself. These would be the final welds on the frame. It was very gratifying knowing my custom frame was almost complete and that I had done a lot of the work. Final cleanup. I'm gonna ask Tommy to do it because it's quite difficult managing something that large. Normally, Tommy paints his unicycles metallic blue. I opted to take mine to a powder coater for the loudest shade of orange they had. They didn't offer a neon orange, so I settled on this shade they called fluorescent orange. When I took this picture to powder coaters, I was like a little kid on Christmas Day. I 
I almost went out of my mind deciding which hub to use for my giraffe. I didn't want to use a track style hub like you see here on the left, so I thought I'd use a Schwinn bolt-on style hub that I had in my collection. That's it on the right. As you can see, it uses three bolts to hold the sprocket to the hub. It's a 28 spoke design which worked fine for their giraffes. Unfortunately, that would necessitate a 28 spoke rim. Those are not plentiful unless you go with a Schwinn S7. Using that forces you to use their odd sized S7 tire. All fine and dandy, but I prefer a standard 20 inch rim and tire. Nimbus offers their giraffe hub which has 36 spokes and bolt-on sprocket accommodations for six bolts. Awesome! I did go with that, but it created more issues when it came to sprockets. First of all, Tommy has always used a one-piece crank. He notes they are strong, plentiful, and inexpensive. All his plans and jig work are based on one-piece cranks. So a one-piece crank it is, but the Nimbus hub is not designed for a one-piece crank. Therefore, we needed to make a sprocket compatible with a single piece crank. Okay, so I bought this hub and this sprocket from unicycle.com. It's a Nimbus hub for their giraffe. It does support the bolt-on style sprocket. I'll have to get bolts, but uh, that's preferable over the track style, correct? Got the right words? Yeah. Okay, so I went ahead and bought a second one of these thinking we would use it for the bottom bracket, but then Tommy pointed out that even though it has this, we got a big issue with this. We would not have a major issue if we used a standard bicycle sprocket. As you can see, it fits up tight. It just needs welded in place to get rid of the small bit of play you have in there. However, these parts are cut out and that weakens it. So it could flex and then the chain could possibly come off and then you crash and burn and break bones. So, what's a guy to do? After lots of discussion, we decided to modify sprockets Tommy already had in stock. Long ago, he had a large batch of 25 tooth sprockets stamped for him. He ordered them with the center hole small so they could be enlarged as needed for different situations. So we decided to go with his sprockets for both top and bottom and machine them as needed for this project. Problem solved, but lots of work ahead to make them compatible. On the plus side, they would be maximum strength. Sprocket flex and the resulting chain issues would not be a worry. The first one we worked on was for the crank set. In order to enlarge the center hole, we used yet another custom made jig. Rather than center the jig, Tommy said we needed to center the sprocket. The sharpie lines on the milled sprocket show the tooth valleys we used to center it. And yes, that took me forever. Once it was centered, we used a cutter to enlarge the hole a little bit at a time until we arrived at our target size. Once we had the center hole cut, Tommy milled out what's called the drive pin hole. It mates up with the drive pin on the crank. Tommy has a custom jig for doing that, of course. At this point, you've probably lost count of the number of jigs Tommy has made. The wheel sprocket also required lathe work to enlarge the center hole. Then Tommy created the bolt holes using the Nimbus sprocket as a template. Could I have received a better result? No way. When it came to the seat post, Tommy gave me three choices. 
I could either make one from scratch, buy one already made, like the one you see here, or a third option which I went with. From a money point of view, it would have made sense to just buy one, but that didn't seem appropriate for our project. I wanted there to be some fabrication. Tommy's plan for that was to cut our own pipe and cannibalize a mounting plate off an old Bill Matthews seat post. The end result would be heavy duty because Tommy uses thicker tubing than what is usually used. Here I am cutting off the tube from the Bill Matthews seat post. There's nothing wrong with the seat post, the tube is just the wrong size. After the tube was cut off, we used the grinding wheel and milling machine to remove all remnants of the tube and welt. Okay, I'm happy with that. With the two pieces ready, Tommy used this jig to tack weld the top side. For the bottom weld, he has a special trick that he will now explain. Okay, we're about to weld the top plate to the seat post. We've already tack welded it to my quarter inch extra tilt top plate, patent not pending. And what we do is we're putting on this brass stud. The reason why it's brass is during the welding process I'm going to be rotating it and it'll arc between the two parts, but it will not bond itself in place with the arcing, whether it be copper or brass. This pic shows the bottom weld while it was still hot. As you can see, we also deburred the bottom end and beveled its edge with the grinding wheel. After that, I was off to the powder coaters again. I had these pieces plated with what they called Sermachrome, which is also known as Chrome Coat. It is a shiny alternative to chrome and claimed to last 10 years before corroding. It is also less expensive than chrome. Every choice I made on plating and parts was made with rust and corrosion prevention in mind. The giraffe will reside in my unheated shop, and those are problems I have to deal with here in the Midwest. Okay, so we've got seven days down and two to go. For day eight, we had the simple task of building the wheel. Simple for Tommy, but not for me. Down to the final one on side one. Oh, yeah. Just like an old fashioned record, now we gotta flip it over and play the other side. Okay. So tell us about this rim a little bit here, Tommy. What's there to know about it? It just, Gary chose to have a double wall aluminum extruded rim. I wanted aluminum because I don't want to ever rust. I wanted double wall because I'm an overkill kind of guy on strength. Okay. Grab the spokes that are dangling. And flip the wheel over. Now there was one spoke missing out of that batch. Oh. Now there's two or three spokes missing out of the batch. And it's on film. <laughs> <laughs> Easy everybody be doing. <laughs> Are we starting over? <laughs> well, at this point, Gary's put in half the spokes on one side of the wheel. And now we've actually got to look from one spoke to the other spoke to judge the final alignment so that it ends up properly in the valve hole. When it's all said and done, you're supposed to leave a great big open gap at the valve hole so it's always easy to inflate the tire. So I'm down to the last two spokes. This is a video just for myself, just to remember how it goes. So I got one that comes from below and one that comes from the top. They're the, again the last two. The way I remember it is I look for the last one that came from below. I find it and then I count four spoke holes over. One, two, three, four. That's where it's going to go. And then the guy from the top looks like it just dropped over, but they have to cross, which is counterintuitive because they kind of bend and, and hit each other. And then I put the nipples in and that will complete it. So they've got a, a big enough opening that the nipple can go sideways and you have to bend this a little bit to mate up with it. And then you take the special tool that's got a nipple and looks like a flat blade screwdriver. Get it started a few threads. And then do the same thing with the very last spoke. So 
Now that you've done this project, could you say that you're outspoken? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> or you're spoken for. <laughs> it's now assembled. It's. Well, Gary has spoked up his wheel. You know, we're at the wheel truing phase. And what we have here is my wheel truing stand collection. When you ever buy a bicycle from a basic discount store, they actually are told to true the wheels on the bicycle without getting worried about the, uh, the tightness of the cups and the cones and the trueness of it. So originally I started off with your basic truing stand and that served me well for years. As people were starting to order more and more smaller unicycles, these little 12 inch and 16 inch wheels didn't really fit and the truing stands were meant for 20 to 27 inch wheels. So I actually bought another truing stand and resized it down so it actually would actually true 12 and 16 inch wheels mostly for double wheels and triple wheelers and standard unicycles. So there's another dedicated one. But I always felt bad that over the years when you true a wheel, a true unicycle wheel, then when you put it in there, it wasn't being trued on the bearings, but it was resting in the fingers on the axle, which weren't a constant. And I felt bad, but eventually the industry created a total different truing stand. These arms, when they go, they pivot in and out. These arms, when they go, they run dead parallel. So for about $350, I bought this one and modified to actually ride on the true unicycle bearing the way it would actually sit in the unicycle fork and would get a better truing job out of it. But way back around 1981 when I used to build a lot of large wheeled unicycles I actually built a dedicated truing stand just to true the large big wheels that we used to ride. And so that one is sitting there also. So this gave me better jobs. Whenever you buy one from somebody else, they may actually just be truing it on the frame because that's what their resources is. They're only just putting together one wheel. But I actually have a dedicated truing stand for large wheeled unicycles and it has been used all the way up to 56 inches with attachments to it. This is my truing stand collection. Nobody has a bigger one than I. So Tommy, you're truing my wheel here. What are the different aspects of truing? Well, for normal bicycle wheels, you want both side to side and up and down uh, so that you don't vibrate so much with the up and down when you're riding. So you want to bring that critical also. So if you're a high speed bicyclist tooling down the mountain at 60 miles an hour, you will feel those vibrations. But we don't do 60 miles an hour on unicycles yet. <laughs> Now a 10-speed bicycle could have an offset dish, right? So obviously we're not doing that. We are centering it, as, even with the 10-speed, we are centering it between the two lock nuts. So even the 10-speed wheel or 15-speed wheel, it'll always, the rim will always be centered over those two reference points. But one set of spokes will more have more up and down, and the other one will have more of an angle to it, and it'll be dished, appear to be dished off one side. These spokes will be equal angle between the two of them. We're not trying to make room for all those extra gears on one side. So on a good day, if you've got a wheel assembled, how long does it take you to true it? Well, in the past, when I used to do a lot at a time, I could actually smoke it and true one every 30 minutes. But it was the constant wheel after wheel after wheel. This was going to take me about, uh, well, we smoked it for... If I smoked it and trued it, about an hour, hour and 10 minutes until I got used to this particular rim. How long does it take you to true a one of your big wheels? That would also take about an hour. That's only 56 spokes. It may be a bigger wheel, but this is 36 spokes. Uh, the bigger wheels in the past had 56 spokes, so that's the only difference is a few extra, 56, 36, 20 extra spokes. Just because it's big, it just has the number of spokes that you're dealing with. How about an off-center wheel? How long does it take to uh, assemble and true one of those? With the bicycles are bouncing up and down when you ride? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because I have an existing chart, 
and some jig work, uh, I generally bill about eight hours of time from the start to the finish of shipping the complete project. So that's what I judge about eight hours. Per wheel? No, no, for the set of wheels for a bicycle. Set of wheels. Right. Got but it. it's all because I've got an existing chart. If I don't have a chart and somebody wants a specific amount of hop, then I'd have to cut and thread each one of the spokes as needed. And then it would be a lot slower with the chart. And I have existing 12 groups of spokes and boxes that I just go through and pick and choose as needed from the chart. Mm. So that sped things up a lot. Okay. All right, Tommy has now finished truing my wheel. I love it. After that, we put on the tube and the tire. You gotta admit, that's one sexy wheel. If you're watching this, you might think all we need to do is assemble the unicycle. That's not the case. Important steps remain that will make the difference between a good result and an excellent result. <laughs> okay, we're at the stage now where we're about to weld the sprocket to the crank arm to eliminate any play from rocking back and forth. So here I'm actually going to spin this and carefully look at it. The hole in the sprocket is slightly bigger than the crank arm. This allows for a little bit of play and the sprocket will get off center. And so I will carefully tap it until it's centered. Although not as critical on the super tall unicycles, but it is really critical on the short four footers and, and five footers where the chain would get tight and loose more noticeably. So it's just using your eye and, and tapping it little by little by little. And I'll find the high spot and I'll put it in the saddle of the tooth. Not pound on the top of the teeth where I'll bend them. It's kind of like truing a, a wheel for roundness. Right. And so I will carefully, lightly tap on it as needed and little by little coax it in the center. Sometimes it can go dead on the first time or just you fight with it and you fight with it and fight with it until you get it as centered as possible before you hit it with a welder. Okay, here we go. Done for one side. After cleaning up the welds, Tommy put the crank back in the jig so he could true the sprocket one last time. This time it was for truing from side to side. This was necessary due to warping from those last welds. I'm not tapping over individual teeth but the sprocket as a whole. I'm satisfied. With the sprocket true, Tommy had me spray over the welds with clear coat so they wouldn't rust. Now it was finally time for assembly. I was real excited when we got the bearing cups installed. It was starting to get that new car look. You keep moving it around as much as you can to coat every aspect and get grease down inside that ball cage. Grease is cheap. Don't be stingy on the grease. And what exactly kind of grease is this? Telephone grease. Mm. The grease is actually park grease put out by the bicycle industry, so their choice, kind of a medium weight grease. Usually it's a white lithium grease, this happens to be green. I get as much as I can in there. And then I will take and put a liberal batch inside the cups to make sure they're thoroughly coated. Make sure I coat every bit of it. The grease, grease acts as a lubricant and a rust preventative. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, I'll need the other ball cage. I didn't get greasy, messy putting the first one together, but now I have to. side of the cycle has a left hand thread. Come on kids. Now we'll assemble it and it'll be a little bit snug and it's after the test first test ride sometimes you take it apart because the cups will actually seat further into the frame from the, the tightness of the chain and the balancing and the hopping. Okay. If I were shipping off a unicycle, actually, we'll test ride them first and then disassemble them to put in a box and I'll check and verify and make a, a second stab at adjusting it. Okay. But if I've done it right to begin with, it usually rarely needs a second adjustment. Greasy! Oh yeah. I'm digging it. Seven and a half foot tall fun machine is coming together. Okay. Uh, tab with washer, no. Washer with tab. And then the last one, yes. There's what I consider unnecessary bounce back and forth. So usually what I do that just to minimize the play. I want the tab that's in the center of this washer to bite as good as possible. In that keyway. Yep. And so I turn this round item slightly oval. So it goes deeper into that groove as possible. This is something simple. A lot of details. Yeah, a little bit more. Well, some of it has to do with it, just I've seen them pop out before. Just, okay. If I go two, four, I just gotta hit it from the other direction. It'll, the technique gets a little bit oval now. Much better. Well, I want to feel the tightness I got going on right now for the moment. Make sure it's not loose. But it will go under just a little bit tight on purpose. At that point, it was time to move on to the chain. We needed three boxes of chain for my giraffe. This is a hand tool pin pressure for extracting the links out of a chain. We don't want any master links on the unicycles whatsoever. So we'll assemble it. So one piece here, we're going to push out the pin. Mm -hmm. mm, where's my needle nose? There we go. And remove the unnecessary piece, leaving the pin still in there. Yeah. Hand me another chain. And lunch case. We will reconnect the chain. And push the pin back in place with the same tool. Making sure it's equal on both sides when you're done. Mm. Oops, too far, but that's when you flip it back over. Now 
for it to be equal. And it's still stiff, but what you do is you take it and you wiggle it back and forth and twist it. And now the stiffness. Not, not quite enough yet. It's gone. Sweet. And now we've spliced two chains together. Tommy finished splicing my chain together, then had me put it on the giraffe and start to adjust the chain tension. The bottom of the frame has a chain tensioner on each side with a nut you can adjust. You adjust both sides to achieve the desired tension and keep the wheel lined up straight with the frame. Okay, Tommy's made the chain. We got it on there. We've got it roughly tensioned. Now I'm going to ask Tommy to explain uh, the proper way to tension it, to finish the tension. Okay, um... Right now we've definitely got it too loose because if the chain can actually come down and hit the frame, it's an undesirable aspect. We're awfully, awfully close as to what he's got on there. I almost want to get a vibration out of it. So I'd probably rotate it about one or two more nuts, but when you're rocking in place, the chain will naturally loosen up. That's the good thing about the Schwinn sprockets of 26 teeth versus the original stuff where it used to be 20 teeth, is it brought the chain further away from the frame, less likely to clank the frame. And this is awfully close, so it's, you know, there, there's, a, there's a frame in the way, you're trying to crush the frame so you can't bow the frame over to one side. That's why we're still able to get by with a single chain versus a double chain. And um, we're good. Just a little bit more rotation on those chain tighteners. And that part will start to spin. Actually, we could actually do it now. And we'll do this later on and crank it in both directions quite a while. Make sure there's no pops or pings. The sprockets are very, very downright close to perfectly centered so there's no tightening and loosening of it. You can feel it in your hands. If it was off-center, you would feel tight, loose, tight, loose, tight, loose. So I kind of blew it on the ending here. My excitement distracted me from getting video of the final assembly. I'm hoping I can make up for it with this drum solo. Your brother could do it.